understand our pink noise filter on an intuitive level, I'm going to make several approximations simply to make the calculations easier. Basically, I can do them in my head rather than having to whip out a calculator. Now, the first three of these approximations are all within 5% of the actual values. And given that the resistors are probably 5% and the capacitors are probably either 5 or 10% values, then that really will not affect things too much. We'll talk about the other two approximations when we get to them. First of all, I'm going to change those two resistor values. Instead of 47K, I'm going to make that 50K, a lot easier to work with. And instead of 330K, I'm going to make that 300K. Now, if you actually built this filter, you almost certainly would not be able to hear the difference with those changes in the resistance values. Our next approximation may seem a little bit flaky, but it does help in doing the math in your head. Since I would prefer to work with frequency in hertz rather than frequency in radians per second, we're going to have to have a factor of 2 pi in our equations. And so I'm simply going to say 2 pi is approximately 6. It's actually 6.28 blah blah blah, but that's pretty close. For the input resistor, what I would really like would be a gain of 1, or 0 decibels, at DC. So I'm going to change that 100K input resistor to 300K to match the impedance of the feedback network at DC. That doesn't really affect the way the filter works. It just makes it easier to compare the DC gain to gain at higher frequencies. Finally, and this is probably the approximation that has the most effect on the operation of this filter, I am simply going to use the magnitudes of the impedances of the two capacitors, although this will introduce some errors into our analysis. It does make an intuitive understanding of this circuit easier since you don't have to deal with a bunch of complex numbers. First, note that in our feedback network there are three branches. There is a single fixed resistor, 300K. There is a single capacitor, 1 nanofarad. And there is a series combination of a 10 nanofarad and a 50K. The basic idea here is that if one of those branches has a lower impedance than the other two, it's the one controlling the overall impedance of the network. For example, if you have a 1K in parallel with a 10K, the 10K is a lot bigger than the 1K, and so the parallel combination is pretty close to 1K. It's about 900 ohms, or 0.9K. On the other hand, if you had two 1Ks in parallel, then that's going to make a fairly large difference. Because then instead of 1K, you've got 500, half of that impedance. To summarize this, at very low frequencies, the 300K has the smallest impedance of the three branches. And it's not changing with frequency. And so the frequency response is flat at really low frequencies, sub-audio frequencies. For low frequencies in the very low audio range, then the branch with the 10 nanofarad and 50K takes over. It now has the smallest impedance, and it's decreasing as frequency increases, and so the response starts dropping at roughly 6 dB per octave. At mid-frequencies, say in the hundreds of hertz, the impedance of the 10 nanofarad is getting fairly close to the 50K resistor, and although it keeps decreasing, it's heading asymptotically toward 50K, so it's not changing very much. The other two impedances are considerably larger than that, so since the smallest is still that 10 nanofarad 50K combination, and it's not changing much, the response flattens out. Finally, for higher frequencies, once you get up into the kilohertz range, then the 1 nanofarad impedance 
drops below the impedance of the other two branches. It takes over the response, and again, you get a roll-off of about 6 dB per octave. That's the synopsis. Let's look at the details. Let's start at very low frequencies, and since I claimed that the 300K has the lowest impedance at these frequencies, let's see at what frequencies this is really a valid assumption. Of the two capacitors, the 10 nanofarad will have the smaller impedance at any given frequency, so let's look at that, and just as a ballpark figure, let's ask the question, at what frequency is the impedance of the 10 nanofarad about 10 times that 300K, in other words, 3 megohms? If you work this out, you'll see that this comes out to about 5 hertz. Now again, remember these are approximate values. We're not trying to get an accurate description here. We're just trying to wrap our heads around how this circuit works. Also note while we're here that the impedance of the 1 nanofarad is going to be 10 times the impedance of the 10 nanofarad, so it's considerably larger. Now, as frequency starts going up above 5 hertz, if you double that to 10 hertz, then the impedance is going to be cut in half to 1.5 meg, and that's still a good bit larger than 300K. The response will start falling off, but not very fast. If you double that again to 20 hertz, which is very close to the bottom end of human hearing, then the impedance of that 10 nanofarad is 750K. And now that's getting fairly close to our 300, and as frequency continues to increase, the impedance of the 10 nanofarad continues to drop, and our response starts dropping. Now note, at this point, the impedance of the 10 nanofarad is still considerably greater than the 50K resistor it's in series with, so I'm just sort of ignoring that. Now as the frequency continues to increase, Let's ask the question, okay, when is the impedance of that 10 nanofarad equal to 50K, the resistor it's in series with? So if you munch that out, again, using our approximations, you come out with 300 hertz. Also note that at 300 hertz, the impedance of the 1 nanofarad is about 500K, so it's still considerably bigger and will have little effect. As we increase the frequency above 300 hertz, the impedance of the 10 nanofarad continues to get smaller, but remember it's in series with 50K, so the overall impedance of that branch is going to asymptotically approach 50K. In other words, the impedance is going to start leveling off. For a while, that branch is still the lowest, and so it's the dominant factor, but it's not changing much, so your response starts leveling out. Since the 10 nanofarad 50K branch is now fairly close to 50K, we then need to ask ourselves the question, at what frequency does the 1 nanofarad branch start getting close to 50K, and thus will begin to take over the response of this circuit? And if you calculate that out, you come out with 3000 Hertz. So above 3000 hertz, now the 1 nanofarad takes over the response. It becomes the smallest of the three impedances. And as the frequency continues to increase, you start heading back to a roll-off of minus 6 dB per octave. So if we look at our plot again, you'll see exactly what we described. At low frequencies, sub-audio frequencies, the response is fairly flat. And then starting around 15 or 20 hertz, the response starts to drop off at about minus 6 dB per octave until you get into the low 100 hertz range. And then it starts leveling out as that 10 nanofarad 50K branch starts approaching a minimum of 50K. But then, in the low kilohertz range, the 1 nanofarad impedance starts getting close to 50K, and then gets smaller than 50K, and again, you get a response of about minus 6 dB per octave. If you look at the overall response of this circuit, 
if you compare 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, you'll see that the total decrease in gain is just over 30 decibels, which is what we were after. And nowhere does the actual response stray too far from our ideal minus 3 dB per octave. Next in this series of videos, we will take our pink noise signal, filter it some more, and obtain a sub-audio random signal. This signal would be used primarily for control purposes.